Welcome, everyone. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce the, two, the 2011 College of Engineering Distinguished Scholar and Lecturer, Professor Theodore Moustakas. We call him Ted. Ted has been a professor of the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department at Boston University since 1987 and a professor of physics since 1991. He received his bachelor's degree in physics from Aristotle University, that's in Greece, and a PhD degree in solid state science and engineering from Columbia University. He has held research and visiting faculty positions at Harvard University, Princeton University, MIT, Aristotle University, IBM Watson Research Laboratory, and Exxon Corporate Research Laboratories. He's told me none of them are, can, 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 can compare to Boston University. Ted joined electrical and computer engineering just as the college was beginning to establish PhD programs. He played a leading role in propelling our ECE department into the front rank of doctoral programs nationwide in a very short period of time, and has helped establish Boston University as a national center of photonics research. Ted's work and reputation also contributed greatly to the college's critical mass of research expertise in material science and engineering. It made our establishment of the interdisciplinary division a natural move for the college. Ted is the division's associate head and has assisted other leading faculty in material science and engineering throughout the university in putting this division on a national map in just a few, a few short years. A researcher of international renown, Ted is perhaps best known for his inventing the process that made the blue LED possible, one of 25 patents registered in his name. He's the author of some 300 publications and has been cited in research literature more than 7,000 times. He's the co-editor of eight books, including Gallium Nitride I and the incredible sequel, Gallium Nitride II. <laughs> I like the second one better. The intellectual property that has resulted from his work has been licensed to a number of companies, including the major manufacturers of blue LEDs in the United States and Japan. Ted is a fellow of the American Physical Society and the Electrochemical Society. He is an active member of the Materials Research Society, the Electronic Materials Committee, and he is, on, and he is a member of the advisory board of the North America Molecular Beam Epitaxy Conference. Recently, he was named recipient of the Molecular Beam Epitaxy Innovator Award for his pioneering contributions to this field. His research focuses on the development of nitride semiconductors, the topic of which he'll discuss today. He is currently working to create visible and ultraviolet LEDs and lasers for solid state white lighting, water and air sterilization, and identification of biological and chemical agents. Please join me in welcoming Boston University's College of Engineering 2011 Distinguished Scholar, Professor Theodore D. Moustakis. Thank you very much, Ken, for the warm introduction. Uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as the dean said, uh, the topic will be uh, nitride semiconductors and how uh, we envision applying those uh, for uh, solid state lighting and uh, applications like water and air purification. In, uh, <coughs> uh, I am uh, privileged to follow uh, the uh, three uh, distinguished uh, scholars who have received uh, the award the uh, previous years, uh, Professor John Ballew, uh, uh, Professor uh, Teich, and Professor Bizio. Uh, in, uh, <coughs> uh, 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 before I start uh, the talk, I want to tell you material science is perhaps one of the most interdisciplinary fields uh, from all sciences. So if you don't have good collaborators, you are not likely to make good progress. Uh, and I was blessed to have good collaborators uh, within uh, Boston University as well as outside Boston University. And specifically, I want to spend a couple of minutes uh, to point out uh, where the collaboration occurs. Professor Paella, whom we hired from Bell Laboratories, um, I believe in 2003, um, he has participated in all, in the most of the aspects of the work I will describe today. Uh, Professor Bellotti is a theorist and he was always supportive in uh, 
uh, in our experimental work. Uh, Professor Del Negro, uh, uh, we started collaboration recently uh, in a laser program uh, 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 which is funded by DARPA. Uh, Professor Unlu uh, and uh, my group collaborated in the early part of his arrival in the university, then he drifted into other aspects of optics. Uh, in the mechanical engineering department, uh, uh, we had a very strong collaboration with Professor Basu in, uh, in within his expertise in electron microscopy. In the physics department, I collaborated strongly with Professor Ludwig and Professor Smith, uh, Ludwig in the area of the structure of the materials, and Professor Smith in the area of the band, the electronic band structure of the materials. Outside the university, I collaborated with Professor Smith at uh, Arizona State University, Professor Heskey at the University uh, of uh, uh, Nevada at Las Vegas, uh, Professor McCroville at the Warwick University, and uh, 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 Caracostas, Comnino and Palura in the Aristotle University, and uh, Professor Nuet at uh, Grenoble in France, and, Prof and Dr. Tzu at Bell Laboratories. Now, uh, uh, in addition to, I was blessed to have outstanding postdoctorals as well as um, uh, 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 graduate students who now all have graduated and moved on. Uh, in um, uh, those graduate students, uh, four of them came from the physics department, one from the manufacturing department, and the rest are from the electrical engineering uh, department. They all have moved into outstanding uh, 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 jobs. Um, uh, current students include, um, and, and scholars include the individuals listed in here. And uh, uh, in addition to, I want to stress uh, how important for my work was both the presence of the photonic center as well as the outstanding maintenance of the facilities. Uh, the work I will report in here would not have been done if it was not from the individuals listed in here. Um, now, uh, the way I structure the talk, I will give you first a, a brief introduction and background on the materials I will be talking to. And, uh, and then uh, uh, I will, uh, I will um, uh, dive into directly into applications, which is the easier, easier part of the talk. Uh, and uh, the applications, um, uh, it will be um, related to how we uh, develop in LEDs for general illumination applications. In other words, uh, in order to replace this kind of light sources. Uh, and uh, I will be using the term solid state lighting for that. And uh, how we use uh, ultraviolet LEDs uh, for water, air uh, purification, and surface, surface sterilization primarily in hospitals. Uh, after I do this, uh, people who I will get into more um, uh, specifics of how we, we did the, uh, we influenced the field uh, by uh, describing some of uh, big use uh, scientific contributions to the development of these materials. And some people may, uh, who are not specialists, may want to uh, politely <laughs> leave if, if it turns out to be um, uh, too, too difficult to follow. Um, now, uh, in, uh, uh, perhaps uh, I, I should go back to this slide and say uh, I am humbled uh, to uh, come in here and talk to you about solid state lighting. A boy, I was born in a small village in Greece, and I was studying my school books and my, uh, my, my extra curriculum, Tarzan uh, uh, books. Uh, using a lantern uh, uh, burned with oil uh, because we did not have electricity. Um, now, uh, these are the materials I will be talking about. Uh, the, the community knows, th knows it as gallium nitride. In reality, however, it is indium nitride and aluminum nitride as important semiconductors. And what I did here, I plotted them uh, what is known to the specialist energy gap of the semiconductor. Uh, if you prefer uh, uh, to uh, uh, see it in, in wa wavelengths, uh, the indium nitride has um, uh, a response at approximately two microns, 
gallium nitride approximately 360 uh, nanometers and aluminum nitride uh, uh, 200 nanometers. As a result, this is the uh, only family uh, of semiconductors who cover uh, the entire range from the near uh, infrared uh, to deep into the UV. Uh, and, uh, <coughs> and so, in fact, um, uh, since uh, Professor Paella uh, joined the group, uh, we uh, extended this range of, of potential applications of these materials all the way down to terahertz region uh, by, uh, by making emitters based on quantum wells between those materials. So, um, uh, uh, so for those of you in the field, uh, a, a, a semiconductor when it is direct band gap semiconductor means you can make emitters like LEDs and lasers. Uh, and, uh, and thus we can cover with um, uh, the entire, sp entire spectral region, uh, as I said, from the terahertz to deep into the UV. Now, of course, uh, in semiconductors, to be useful, uh, you should be able to dop them uh, N-type and P-type, and we managed to do that, as I will be showing you. Uh, the other thing is, unfortunately, those materials, you cannot grow them into a bulk form uh, from the liquid phase, and therefore we do not have native substrates of gallium nitride or aluminum nitride or indium nitride, and thus we uh, learn how to grow them by a process called heteroepitaxy into uh, other substrates. Uh, they have some uh, unique properties, very high thermal conductivity compared to traditional semiconductors like silicon and gallium alcinite. They have a, a tremendous chemical resistance against attacks by acids and, uh, and bases, uh, and uh, they are radiation hard materials. Uh, all of, and, and, uh, and finally, they are piezoelectric materials. All of these properties make them unique for applications which silicon and gallium arsenide uh, semiconductors are not suitable for. Now, uh, here I discuss uh, the variety of devices uh, which you can make uh, from this class of semiconductors. For ener energy-related devices, we can make photovoltaic solar cells. And we have, uh, uh, with Professor Paella, uh, we have an activity and active uh, proposals to uh, uh, the National Science Foundation uh, in this area. Also, by the virtue, uh, uh, by the virtue that these materials are, are quite ionic, you can use them to produce hydrogen uh, using the process called water photolysis. Uh, now, you can make optoelectronic devices, uh, and as you know, blue lasers, uh, which are in here, have been already made and they have been implemented in the Blu-ray and other kind of approaches uh, for uh, optical recording and so on and so forth. Uh, UV lasers is something new and we are the recipients of a grant from DARPA recently among uh, four other groups. Um, uh, and uh, I highlighted those because this is where I will emphasize my talk. Although we are addressing the various aspect devices also. Uh, for example, we do terahertz emitters, optical modulators, and detectors, but I will not have time to discuss those. In the past, uh, some of the students graduated by uh, fabricating transistors uh, for high power and high temperature applications because of the high thermal conductivity and the large energy gap of those semiconductors. Uh, finally, uh, you can make sensors based on MEMS uh, due to their piezoelectric nature. Uh, and uh, such kind of sensors are suitable for hostile environments, uh, for example, for uh, nuclear reactors or outer space because of the properties I highlighted earlier in the previous view graph. Now, uh, of course, what I tell to my students, you can make as many devices you want but if these devices don't lead to some technology, they are not useful. Uh, and so in here, I tell you uh, uh, how, what kind of technologies can be based on those semiconductors, and some, some of them have already implemented 
some of the, I should call them, potential uh, technologies. Solid state lighting is still uh, to come. In other words, we are not ready yet to replace these light sources. Uh, and uh, uh, water and air uh, and surface sterilization is also still to come. Uh, but full color displays, uh, you need to go to Japan or to China or to Korea to see that all the outdoor displays are based on LEDs today. Uh, there are no displays based on neon uh, lamps any longer. Uh, uh, optical recording, uh, the blue lasers have done that already. Uh, true color uh, uh, capping uh, has not yet been implemented because we haven't been able to make a an efficient green laser, although this is around the corner. Uh, uh, high temperature and high power electronics uh, is, uh, is, is almost here, and there is active R&D uh, effort um, uh, um, uh, in, uh, in, in lo locally also. Uh, microwave electronics, because it happens that the speed of electrons in gallium nitride is even higher than that of gallium arsenide. Uh, uh, BEM sensors, uh, a specific application underwater communication, primarily during navigation of uh, ships uh, in order to see the terrain in the case uh, of uh, problems with the terrain, and uh, secure space-to-space -space communication UV lasers, uh, and this will occur when the UV lasers are made, and photovoltaics also is going to become a big application. Now. Uh, let me spend a little bit um, uh, time discussing uh, the evolution of lighting um, and, uh, and how LEDs uh, are compared with conventional light sources. As you know, the incandescent light sources were developed in the beginning of the century, and, uh, uh, and uh, they were imp uh, improved uh, recently, but still uh, their efficiency uh, is uh, less than uh, 50 lumens per watt. Specifically, the incandescent light sources, uh, only less than 10% of the electricity we supply to them is converted into light. 90% uh, and more is converted into heat. Uh, so in Europe, in fact, uh, they have now um, outlaw uh, the use of those uh, and the fabrication of those uh, sources. Uh, then in the 40s, um, the fluorescent light sources came along, and uh, uh, initially they were slightly more efficient uh, than, uh, than uh, the incandescent light sources. Uh, recently, uh, they have advanced close to 100 lumens per watt. Uh, and um, uh, there are uh, some industrial-related uh, sources uh, uh, which are even more efficient, but those are not good for general illumination applications. Now, in uh, uh, the LEDs were discovered by Professor Holoniak and his students uh, at Illinois State, uh, Illinois State University in the uh, 1960s. Uh, however, it was not until the 1990s uh, which the progress in uh, LEDs um, uh, took off, and the Department of Energy anticipates, based on this uh, projected progress, by the year 2020, we are going to have approximately 150 to 200 lumens per watt, in which case uh, they will penetrate and replace um, uh, all other light sources for general illumination. Now, uh, uh, anticipating that some of you, uh, like members of my family, um, uh, they are not experts in, uh, in this, I will walk you through the basics of what is LED, because that's where I will focus the most of the talk. An LED is basically a PN junction. And uh, uh, here is uh, something where we grow these materials. And this, uh, which we, I call it N cladding layer, is the material, the semiconductor, which we adopted N type. And you have the P type semiconductor from the other side. And what I call in here the active region is uh, what I will be calling later quantum wells, is where the electrons injected from the N side and the holes, the positive charges in the injected from the P side, they recombine and produce light. Now, uh, for those of you more advanced in this area, 
this is the physical uh, uh, structure, and this is the band structure of the LED, where this side in here is the, the P-type uh, semiconductor, this is the N-type semiconductor, and what I call in here the active region is what I uh, draw here as a quantum well. And uh, from the N side, from the battery, we are sending electrons into the quantum well. From the P side of the battery, we send holes into the quantum well. And those then, uh, they join together. Uh, we call this recombination. And the, uh, the, 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 the energy they lose is emitted uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the form of photons. Now, of course, uh, uh, if uh, all the electrons you injected in here uh, and all the holes are converted into light, we say that the internal efficiency of this LED is 100%. Uh, and uh, however, uh, the light uh, generated in here may not be able to come out to the, in the, uh, to the air uh, because of the difference in the index of refraction of the two materials. And uh, for that reason, uh, if you buy an LED, LED, let's say, from Radio Shack, you will see that the LED is covered with a plastic lens, uh, as shown in here. And the purpose of this plastic lens, uh, it has an index of refraction between the semiconductor and air, so it facilitates the transition of light out of the semiconductor into the air. And we call this process extraction. And, and basically, uh, later, I will be using this terminology, external quantum efficiency of an LED is the product of the internal quantum efficiency, which I just described earlier. Injection efficiency is the ability to, uh, when you put a, a certain voltage in here, all the electrons you put, they eventually make it into the quantum wells. And that we call it injection efficiency and extraction e efficiency is the ability to get the light out of the semiconductor. Now, so with this, uh, um, uh, 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 I think it is enough for, uh, uh, to proceed to describe a more, uh, more intriguing uh, aspects of the LEDs, how we make uh, white light using LEDs. Uh, the traditional, the, uh, the, the most important method uh, is uh, the method which we learn in elementary schools to, re to combine the three primary colors, uh, the green, the blue, and the, and, and the red, uh, with some optics. And, uh, and these are the spectra, the blue, the green, and the, and the red spectrum. And this uh, can make uh, a, a, a very, a very good uh, light, appropriate for reading, let's say, and without uh, tiring you. Now, uh, in addition to the efficiency, which will be a, a theme in this talk. And impor another important issue is uh, the quality of light is determined by this uh, index in here, color rendering index. And the color rendering index is how well the color of an object is reproduced upon illumination with this white light. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and if you make a white light using the three primary colors, the color rendering index is more than 90%, which is satisfactory. Uh, the natural light has a color rendering index uh, 100%. Now, an alternative approach is to use a UV light, a UV LED, and cover it with a powder, which we call it phosphor, and that uh, the UV LED excites in the phosphor uh, red, green, and blue light, and then the three mix together and make white light. And this has a color rendering index uh, uh, 90%. Uh, the, LED, the white light, which we currently have, and you can buy it in, um, in the stores, is a blue LED, which is covered uh, with uh, uh, yellow phosphor. And the uh, combination of the yellow phosphor together with the blue light makes white light, however, the color rendering index for that is only 70%. So this light is definitely not appropriate for general illumination. And the research we do both ourselves in here and other institution is how to uh, accomplish this uh, method or that method uh, of making white light. Now, 
Uh, uh, I want to spend a few minutes uh, to highlight uh, what are the advantages of LEDs and why the Department of Energy is spending significant effort to advance this technology. Uh, they are uh, uh, devices, as I told you, the uh, incandescent light source has an efficiency only 10%. The LEDs have the potential to have an efficiency 100% if you do it right. Uh, and um, and uh, so, as I told you earlier, you can make devices 150 lumens per watt, uh, which is twice as much as the current fluorescent light sources. The other thing is much greater design freedom and flexibility. Uh, for example, uh, you have a dynamic color flexibility, including many whites uh, without to using filters. Uh, and uh, in other words, whites with different temperature. Uh, and uh, the size and the shape flexibility for styling and fixture design, this is very important as well. Uh, and uh, you can turn them instantly on and they are fully dimmable without any color uh, uh, change. And uh, as important, they don't produce any heat and they don't produce any UV in the beam. Now, uh, their uh, reliability also is very important. Uh, and I would like to stress this aspect of it, the long lifetime. They can last from 50,000 to 100,000 hours uh, without having any maintenance. For, uh, for, uh, uh, for that purpose, they live forever. Uh, and uh, as important is environmentally fr fr friendly because they don't have mercury. And uh, in United States alone, uh, uh, the Department of Energy anticipates 20 billion in annual energy cost savings uh, if we uh, replace the existing light sources uh, with, uh, uh, with LEDs. Only in the United States, if we take it worldwide, uh, the, this will be a very significant saving. Now, this corresponds to retiring uh, 30 big um, uh, 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 electrical, uh, 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 large electrical plants. Also, from environmental purposes, uh, a reduction of carbon dioxide emission uh, approximately 150 uh, million tons annually. Now, uh, also besides uh, the solid state lighting, there are all of these niche lighting applications, uh, automobile lighting, uh, track and bus lights, uh, traffic signals, exit signals, holiday lights, uh, commercial uh, advertising signals, and all of this is, uh, 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 they, they anticipate uh, electricity saving potential uh, in, in that neighborhood, um, uh, which some people can appreciate it. Um, now, uh, so uh, now I'm going now to uh, specifically go and uh, discuss uh, uh, UV uh, electromagnetic radiation and its applications. Uh, and how LEDs uh, will uh, have an impact uh, uh, in that area. Uh, the, electro the ultraviolet spectrum extends uh, from 400 nanometers uh, to X-rays, 10, 10 nanometers. And we divide the UV spectrum into UVA from 340 to 400 nanometers. And uh, this kind of radiation is used for currency valid validation uh, for industrial curing of polymers, for phototherapy, uh, and uh, for forensic applications. But there is also the UVB, who extends from 290 to 340 nanometers. And this, is, this kind of radiation is responsible for sunburn. Uh, it's been used extensively for forensic applications. For phototherapy, primarily for skin treatment of psoriasis. And uh, also, this kind of radiation is responsible for skin cancers, uh, the, uh, the malignant melanomas. The UVC radiation, which extends from 200 to 290 nanometers, can be used for free space, non-light of sight communication. And I will show a schematic uh, to uh, understand this uh, application better. Um, it is damaging uh, the microorganism's DNA, uh, and due to that, we can use this uh, radiation 
for water, air, and surface decontamination. Uh, and uh, the Earth's atmosphere absorbs the UVC uh, radiation uh, uh, coming from the sun, and, um, and, the, uh, and, and, uh, and therefore, um, and, uh, and also it can, this radiation, it can be used to detect chemical and biological substances, which has both uh, uh, medical uh, as well as um, security applications. Um, the vacuum UV, uh, which extends from 10 nanometers to 200 nanometers, uh, can be used for semiconductor photolithography in order to make smaller integrated uh, chips. Uh, now, uh, I uh, uh, borrow this um, uh, uh, from a colleague from the Photonics Center, uh, this picture, because he is uh, more uh, schematic and uh, uh, describes the previous picture in a more dramatic form. Uh, uh, when I mention the UVA, uh, used for uh, apoxy uh, curing is this is what you do uh, when you paint your cars. Uh, it can be, uh, this is how you do counterfeit detection. Uh, you can use for inje uh, inject um, uh, uh, printing. Also, you can use this UV radiation for photocatalytic air purification uh, for the outgassing from the cars. Uh, uh, the uh, medical therapy for which I have mentioned, forensic and sensing. Uh, I want to focus in here uh, uh, UV non-line of sight communications. As you know, uh, due to Raleigh scattering, the UV radiation has a high uh, uh, scattering cross-section. Uh, and since our atmosphere is full of particulates of one type or another, uh, if you uh, send a laser with UV light from here, another individual from the other side of the building here can pick up the signal. Uh, it is a very important technology, and, uh, and I am quite certain with our new program on the UV lasers, uh, we are going to impact this kind of technology. Uh, uh, disinfection of surfaces, and I, I did not mention before disinfection of food also, uh, and, uh, and air purification where you put the UV LEDs uh, in, the, in the outlet of your air condition and the water purification and the detection and biology. But as important, uh, uh, if you develop good UV LEDs, you can use our current technology by using phosphor and, uh, and, and convert this into white light. So, um, now, uh, because I mentioned, and uh, I know in the audience there are people uh, in the, in the uh, biological field, um, uh, because I mentioned water purification, uh, I'd like to spend a couple of minutes discussing the germicidal uh, applications of the UC UV C range. Uh, the uh, uh, nucleic acids, acids in uh, DNA and RNA uh, absorb UV radiation in that spectral region from 240 to 290 nanometers, and the peak absorption occurs at 266 nanometers. Uh, now, uh, the, uh, as important is um, uh, the, the absorption is 10 to 20 times more uh, than equal weights of the proteins uh, of the protein component of DNA. In other words, if we knew, if we if we send UV radiation uh, into DNA, uh, the most of it is absorbed by these uh, nucleic acids. Uh, sugars and phosphate uh, components of DNA do not absorb UV above 210 uh, nanometers. Thus, uh, if we do have developed UV light sources at uh, 266 nanometers, uh, then uh, what is happening is it tucks uh, in uh, in the adjacent thymide nuclei in here and dimerize them as, as I show them schematically. And this prevents them from replicating and so the microorganism then would not survive. And as important, uh, evolutionary living cells have learned how to repair the damage of DNA caused by the UVB radiation but because UVC radiation does not penetrate in the atmosphere, they do not know how to resist 
in that radiation. Now, um, so uh, uh, how UV radiation then can be used uh, uh, for those applications? Uh, it was known uh, the germicidal uh, properties of UV light was discovered in the late 1980s, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, late uh, 1800s. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, in France, it was used as early as 1910. Uh, uh, they used mercury lamps uh, for drinking water purification. And also they were using it uh, uh, to uh, disinfect um, uh, pathogens like uh, tuberculosis. Now, in, uh, recently, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency has recommended that UV radiation is the most sound technology uh, to be used for water pur purification uh, instead of using chlorination, which was the other method used until uh, and, and still being used in some municipalities. Now, uh, however, to kill uh, the deadly uh, uh, crypt uh, cryptosporidium uh, protozoa, uh, you need to have uh, 40 millijoules per cubic centimeter of UVC radiation to kill 100% of that uh, uh, protozoa. And uh, the New York uh, City has implemented such a system and it produces two, 200, uh, I'm sorry, 2.2 billion gallons per day and serves 10 million of consumers daily. Now, uh, and in, in Europe, uh, there are uh, such uh, two, uh, 2,000 UV uh, drinking water system implemented already, uh, and uh, in the United States at this moment only 1,000. As important, uh, uh, because of the recent scare, uh, UV radiation also can uh, inactivate the avian flu virus, and, but that uh, will require that we have in hospitals UV systems in office buildings, in planes, in homes, uh, in order to minimize the pandemic influenza, which, as you know, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in 1918, killed 50% uh, of the human population. Uh, now, uh, currently, uh, 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 some of those applications are implemented using mercury-based UV lamps, uh, which, as you know, they are fragile. Uh, they are having very short work, uh, working life. They are mercury-based and therefore environmentally unacceptable. Um, and uh, there are high pressure which are more efficient, but those uh, uh, work at uh, very high temperatures, and therefore they are not suitable for some of the applications. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and then uh, they are prone to gas leaks, uh, and mercury is what is going to sneak out. Uh, and, um, uh, can, uh, uh, and also their output varies as the, la as the lamp uh, heats up. Uh, therefore, UV LEDs is the best uh, solution to those applications I mentioned earlier. The point is their current UV LEDs are inefficient. And uh, what I, I did in here, I, I took uh, the, uh, to show you what is the state of the art of UV as well as the visible LEDs today, and, uh, and what kind of materials we use to, to make them. Uh, now, remember earlier in the uh, second view graph, I, I show you gallium nitrite, indium nitrite, and aluminum nitrite. And if you mix those, you make alloys, aluminum gallium nitrite and indium gallium nitrite. Now, all of these LEDs in, uh, from this point, from 400 nanometers uh, to green in here, they are made out of indium gallium nitride. And all of these LEDs uh, 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 over here, uh, which are in the UV part of the spectrum, they are made out of aluminum gallium nitride. Now, I will uh, remind you again of that equation. This external quantum efficiency is the product of the internal quantum efficiency inside the LED, the injection efficiency, the ability to inject electrons and holes into the LED, and the extraction efficiency, the ability to extract the light. Now, the question uh, and the most challenging areas for scientific research, and that's why our groups in here are focusing on, is uh, why the green LEDs are inefficient, and how, what are the science uh, uh, reasons for that, 
and why the UV LEDs are inefficient. And in the rest of the talk, I will be talking about activities we have in this area and in this area. Now the question is, is it the internal quantum efficiency which causes this, or is this other factors in here? And, uh, <coughs> and we have uh, 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 to, to reach, um, uh, to have to make a certain judgment how we uh, go about, uh, about that. Now, uh, the previous figure I gave you on the, uh, on the uh, green spectrum here, I want to spend a little bit more time and uh, I have a, a, a better picture. These are all LEDs from the violet, uh, blue, and uh, 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 all the way to green uh, based on indium gallium nitride. And as you notice, as we go towards green from the violet, the LED goes from above 40% to practically uh, less than 5%. And at this moment, we do not understand why. Uh, in, uh, because all of those materials are direct bank gap semiconductors, and, and uh, we, it's not clear why this should be happening. We, uh, we have some ideas, and I will discuss them, and that guide us uh, how to do our research. Now, these other, the red LEDs are not based on these materials, are based on the traditional uh, semiconductors, the aluminum gallium uh, arsenide materials. And, uh, and those also, paradoxically, as we go from the red, uh, which is in here, uh, to green, and those also, their efficiency. Those, that we understand why it happens, because as we alloy these materials uh, with more uh, phosphorus, uh, and uh, indium and aluminum to get to access this region here, the material converts from direct bank gap semiconductor to indirect bank gap semiconductor, which you do not expect to make good LEDs. Now, uh, I, I, this other graph I show you here is the sensitivity of our eye and the uh, evolutionary, uh, presumably, uh, uh, the humans uh, develop more sensitivity in the green yellow region of the spectrum. Now, as you know, traffic lights today are being replaced um, uh, uh, with green LEDs, and they are much brighter uh, than what we used before an incandescent light source with a green filter. Uh, and this is because, although they are inefficient, the sensitivity of the eye is very high in that region, and so it the eye compensates for the efficiency of the devices. Now, what do we know about the internal quantum efficiency uh, of these two classes of materials, the indium gallium nitride and aluminum gallium nitride? There is this famous publication in 2006 by Professor Chichibu from Japan uh, in collaboration with uh, the group at uh, Santa Barbara, which is one of the premier groups in nitride semiconductors. And, uh, and uh, as you see here, there are some revealing information. The indium gallium nitride materials, as you see, you can, uh, the internal quantum efficiency, incidentally, it was measured by illuminating the uh, materials with uh, uh, some light and produce what is known photoluminescence, and then divide the photoluminescence intensity at room temperature by the photoluminescence intensity at uh, uh, liquid helium temperature. And uh, because at low temperature, all electrons and holes you inject in the LED, they recombine radiatively and produce light, we believe this ratio will give you the internal quantum efficiency at room temperature, is a, is a good uh, definition. Now, and the, in, the aluminum, the indium gallium nitride materials, as you see, they have an internal quantum efficiency up to 60, to 70 percent, uh, as long as we keep the indium percentage uh, at about below 20 percent. As soon as we exceed this 20 percent, then the efficiency uh, also falls. And, uh, and uh, in order to go to the green light, you have to go to 40 percent indium, which is in here. So by the time you are at 40 percent indium, and this gives us a clue uh, why the green LEDs are inefficient and we need to understand it. Now, uh, Chichibu's paper shows that the aluminum gallium nitride, according to these results, have no hope at all uh, to make UV LEDs, 
because if the internal quantum efficiency is 0.1% at 260 nanometers in here, uh, no matter what the extraction efficiency and the injection efficiency is, uh, you cannot make anything better than that. Uh, and it turns out that this, we have made a very significant pro progress at Boston University, and I hope I will have a chance to, uh, to tell you those results. Now, uh, in order to address uh, these applications which are enumerating here, uh, what ca uh, ki kind of material problems we need, uh, we need to solve? Uh, because the, uh, uh, even though now the field is 20 years old, uh, still these materials are uh, immature comparatively to silicon uh, and gallium arsenide. So we have to study uh, fundamental phenomena like nucleation and growth, uh, on different substrates. Uh, we need to study uh, structure and microstructure uh, in order to uh, uh, learn whether we grow hexagonal material or a cubic material, uh, uh, how the defects are formed. We need to study uh, how to dope this material, NMP type, and we need to study alloying phenomena like phase separation and ordering. Uh, we need to study bulk and surface electronic structure uh, and uh, which are fundamentally in order to be able to make any devices at all. Uh, we need to, uh, to study, uh, to develop materials with low dimensionality, uh, like quantum wells, quantum dots, quantum wires. Uh, we need to learn how to make contacts, uh, because then you cannot make uh, a, a device. Uh, we need to then to develop devices, uh, optical, electronic, and electromechanical devices. So it's a, it's a, it's a tall uh, uh, order in here. And uh, uh, over the, these 20 years, uh, our uh, groups collectively, as I described them before, uh, practically we addressed uh, the most of those aspects, uh, some in greater and some in, uh, in, uh, in others uh, great detail. Now, the method of making these materials, there are um, alternative methods, but I will focus on the method we uh, spend a significant fraction at Boston University. Uh, is, uh, uh, the method is called molecular beam epitaxy. Uh, and, uh, and what it is, it's an ultra high vacuum vessel uh, with uh, a, a, a pressure approximately uh, 10 orders of magnitude below the atmosphere. And, uh, and we put a substrate, which I indicate in here with blue, and with this. Uh, uh, cells in here, we are aiming uh, beams of atoms of gallium, aluminum, and indium, uh, 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 and we have shutters in front of them, and we have also similar uh, uh, sources for dopants, N and P-type dopants. For the nitrogen, however, uh, we employ molecular nitrogen, and molecular nitrogen, as you know, is uh, uh, the two atoms are bonded with three bonds, and therefore is a very strongly bonded uh, uh, molecule, and it's very unreactive, uh, the reason why we have so much nitrogen in the atmosphere. Uh, and uh, so what we have done, and we were, uh, uh, I believe, the, the first to implement that, uh, uh, we, we pass it through a microwave or an RF plasma source and uh, decompose it into atomic nitrogen uh, or uh, radicals, uh, which are very reactive, and then they react with the species we were sending uh, to form the materials we do. Because the, uh, the vacuum, uh, we are working in a, a ultra-high vacuum, we have the ability to aim a beam of electrons uh, tangentially to the sample, and then uh, uh, this, uh, the, beam, the electrons are undergoing diffraction, and then we can study the diffraction pattern on this uh, phosphorescent uh, screen, and from that we can interrogate the structure of the materials as we grow them, uh, which is a, a, a very important feature of this technique. Now, uh, the structure of nitrite semiconductors, uh, contrary to the traditional semiconductors like uh, silicon and gallium arsenide, who have cubic symmetry, those materials have uh, a, a hexagonal symmetry. So this is how the unit cell looks like, and this is the equilibrium structure. However, under certain circumstances, we can make it 
uh, to have the cubic structure and, and that is a metastable structure. Uh, as important, uh, the conversion between these two structures, uh, uh, the, the energy of formation, in other words, uh, of these two allotropic forms, uh, uh, is almost the same with a few, a few millielectronewons. And thus, uh, the conversion uh, between uh, uh, the hexagonal and the cubic uh, takes place very easily by what the specialists know uh, through the formation of stacking forms uh, in uh, this closed packed um, uh, planes, which uh, for the sake of, um, I will uh, not go into details to explain more the stacking forms um, here. Now, uh, uh, so I said earlier, heteroepitaxial growth is a very important issue and because uh, we do not have native uh, substrates. For example, in silicon or gallium arsenide, uh, when you make a device, you start with a gallium arsenide substrate and, uh, and the material you deposit as a device uh, replicates the substrate. The same thing with silicon. We do not have this luxury in here. And, uh, and therefore, the films are grown mostly on foreign substrates. And depending on what kind of substrate we use, if we use a substrate which has a cubic symmetry, then the, we grow the cubic form of, uh, of the nitrides. This is the thing we discovered it, uh, for the first time in here at Boston University and published a series of papers uh, with a student from the physics department. Um, in uh, uh, the, uh, the Wurzai structure, uh, uh, we need to use uh, substrates with hexagonal symmetry. Now, uh, uh, most common substrates used is sapphire uh, from the virtue that it is v uh, readily available and also is, uh, uh, has a hexagonal symmetry uh, and, uh, and it is uh, uh, inexpensive. Uh, uh, however, the lattice mismatch, uh, the difference between the, uh, the distance between the atoms, between the, the gallium nitrate and the sapphire is 16 percent. And as a result, I will be showing you, this leads to the formation of very large density of defects. Now, what we discovered here at Boston University early on in the, in the late, late 80s, to reduce the defect density uh, uh, by implementing several nucleation steps uh, prior to growth. Uh, and um, so the nucleation for which we hold the worldwide um, uh, IP uh, is uh, two. One we call it nitridation, where, as you know, sapphire is aluminum oxide. And uh, we, we develop a method using the plasma sources I discussed with you earlier to convert the surface of aluminum oxide into aluminum nitride. And this is a very important development because now uh, whatever we grow on the top of the aluminum nitride, it recognizes that it is of the same family of materials rather than growing on a, a, on a oxide. The other thing we discover, even though we are um, uh, made significant improvement of the materials by doing this nucleation step, we found out a second nucleation step, which we call it low temperature defective gallium nitride step, uh, um, is necessary to control the propagation of defects generated. So after we do these two nucleation steps, then we go to high temperature and we grow the device layers. Now, uh, an important discovery, which was uh, the result of very strong collaboration between Professor Ludwig uh, and, uh, and, and my group uh, and, uh, and the, the physics student Lee, uh, it was uh, uh, this uh, uh, discovery in 1993. Um, a, a sapphire has a lattice constant 4.76 angstrom and the unit cell of sapphire is, is this one here, uh, the dotted lines. The gallium nitrate, on the other hand, has a lattice constant 3.18 angstroms, a smaller unit cell, and uh, I, I indicate it in here. So therefore, uh, uh, intuitively, uh, we thought the gallium nitrate will replicate the sapphire 
and uh, so it, it will uh, 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 go, this line will go parallel to this uh, side, and so on and so forth. But what we discover is uh, the gallium nitride unicell rotates by 30 degrees uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, 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 adjust with another smaller unit cell of sapphire. And by doing so, there are two benefits. It goes under compressive stress, and second, the lattice constant is going, instead of being 34%, it would have been in here, it becomes uh, significantly less. Uh, in, uh, uh, now, how, how these materials uh, uh, nucleate? Uh, when you start uh, sending uh, Iranian atoms of gallium and nitrogen, let's say, to form gallium nitride, what we discover early on, uh, uh, during the early stages, uh, the materials start forming these hexagons, uh, which I will call them hexagonal domains. And as the material, as we keep putting more material down, uh, the he uh, these hexagons coalesce, as I show schematically in here, uh, and, uh, and they form the crystal. Uh, and uh, and uh, you see, and as the material grows fast, each one of these hexagons will become, uh, become a hexagonal prism. So these materials, by no means, they are not single crystals. They are columnar polycrystalline materials, or very well-oriented polycrystalline materials. However, because the coalescence of this is not likely to be perfect, since this, the substrate and this material we grow, they have different lattice constant, it is not likely when we started the nucleation in here, or in here, or in here, it is not likely those two bring hexagons to coalesce perfectly with each other. And thus, uh, uh, we uh, uh, expect to develop dislocations in, uh, in the regions where the coalescence is imperfect. And this is an example of how the coalescence occur if we grow the material thicker. It's exactly as you tile the, the, uh, the, uh, the floor of your kitchen, uh, the hexagons uh, uh, line themselves uh, next to each other uh, as, as the material grows. Um, in a, a, a very important issue is how uh, uh, we choose the substrate temperature uh, to, because there are all of these stresses in these materials uh, since uh, there is a difference in the lattice constant uh, of the substrate and the film. Uh, now this, uh, for the specialist, uh, the brittle to ductile transition, as uh, you know, uh, in crystals occurs about the half of the melting point of the material. And uh, <coughs> in, in gallium nitride, the melting point is 2800 degrees Kelvin, and therefore you expect this transition uh, to occur at about 1400 degrees Kelvin. And uh, above that uh, temperature, you expect the stress relaxation to occur by formation of dislocations and, and glide. Uh, I do not expect uh, non-specialists to follow this, but it is an important issue. Now, we grow these materials in 1,000 degrees Kelvin, which is significantly less than this, and thus um, uh, we can grow coherent heterostructures uh, beyond what is known as the Matthews critical thickness. Uh, and, and that was a, a, a troubling issue initially, and, uh, and people did not understand it. Um, a, a, as a result, the dislocations primarily occur in the boundaries of the hexagonal domains and not at the domains themselves. In other words, as I was telling you earlier in here, uh, all the dislocations are in here the domains are free of dislocations. Now, uh, to show you uh, how important was this nucleation layers, uh, which we developed uh, in uh, late 80s, early 90s, is, um, as you see, there are all of these defects uh, in here, which we call them dislocations or other defects. And this is the sapphire substrate, and this is the gallium nitride. And, uh, and this is where we put this low temperature gallium nitride buffer, which I told you is a defective material. And you notice uh, this encourages the divergence of dislocations to going straight up, and uh, they annihilate. And as a result, 
This material in here is a few thousand angstroms, but if you make it to be one micron or four microns thick, the dislocations annihilate, and where you put your devices is the material is more or less uh, uh, significantly reduced dislocation density, approximately 10 to the 7 or less. Uh, this work uh, were uh, reported in the early uh, 90s. Now, uh, but the, the, uh, the issue, I guess, uh, I want to make the connection. As you know, in gallium arsenide, you cannot make a laser or an LED if you have anything more than 10 to the 3 dislocations per square centimeter. And I'm telling you in here, we are making very efficient blue LEDs and blue lasers with 10 to the 7 dislocations. And so the natural question is, uh, uh, what, is the, uh, what is the real um, reason that such defective materials to lead to such uh, efficient uh, devices? And uh, I, you know, the opinions vary here. These are my own personal views. I, I identify this as the two most important issues. And, uh, and uh, uh, Professor Kevin Smith uh, having significantly um, uh, 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 contributed in this understanding in here. Uh, the second phenomenon is phase separation, on which I collaborate closely uh, with Professor Basu and, uh, and Professor Ludwig uh, to address those issues. Uh, uh, for the specialist, again, or, or non-specialist, if you cut a material and you create a surface, you create, as the chemist called, dangling bonds, which we call them in semiconductor surface states. Uh, and uh, in the traditional semiconductors, silicon and gallium arsenide, those surface states occur exactly in the middle of the energy gap. And due to that, they are potent rec uh, non-radiative recombination centers. Uh, now, in nitride semiconductors, however, uh, uh, as I will show you evidence, these states have moved from the middle of the gap towards the valence band Due to, their strong, due to the fact that these materials are highly ionic materials. Now, uh, as a result, since the surface states are very close to the valence band rather than in the middle of the gap, they are not expected to be uh, uh, recombination centers. And as you know, they, in most of the devices we know, whether electronic or optical devices, uh, surface recombination is really very important in, uh, in determining the efficiency of the device. The other thing as important, edge dislocations, uh, which I, there are various types of dislocations, but in here I am narrowing to edge dislocations, which in the traditional materials are very harmful in terms of being recombination centers. I am contending that these are not harmful uh, in our materials because those, the edge dislocations, are dangling bonds in, an, in, a, in a series, and thus they are like internal surfaces. And, uh, and, and therefore, those states should occur close to the, uh, uh, close to the valence band. Uh, and as important, uh, uh, the gallium nitride surface, since the surface states are not in the middle of the gap, the gallium nitride surface is not pinned. The Fermi level is not pinned in the middle of the gap, and thus, uh, a, a metal contacts, either ohmic or Schottky contacts, can be formed by choosing metals with appropriate work function. As it opposed to uh, silicon and gallium arsenide, no matter what work function metal you use, the barrier height is always the same. Uh, a significant difference uh, from the traditional semiconductors. Uh, the other phenomenon uh, which I believe uh, uh, it was God-given uh, and, uh, and gave us uh, these devices to operate so efficiently is that uh, the phase separation in indium gallium nitride. Uh, now this, uh, the, uh, and this happens because the indium atoms is 11% larger than the gallium atoms, and therefore uh, when you try to make an alloy with dissimilar size atoms, uh, then the material has a tendency uh, to phase separate into its binary components. Now, um, and, uh, uh, and so since we have this tendency uh, for phase separation, uh, this, uh, the materials we grow, quantum wells, for example, or bulk materials, 
they have a tendency to have some regions with more indium, some regions with less indium, which we call it compositional homogeneities. And for the specialist, this is translated into band structure potential fluctuations. And, uh, and therefore, when we injected electron hole pairs from the battery into the LED, uh, the electrons and holes are localized in these potential fluctuations, and uh, they don't migrate around to find defects to recombine non-radiatively. And I believe these are the two reasons why these materials uh, uh, have worked. Now, uh, and of course, what I suggest to my students spend lots of time in the laboratory, but as much in the library. Uh, and uh, some of these phenomena regarding the surface states were known all the way in 1969 uh, by this group at Caltech. And, uh, and my student, uh, uh, James Forezzi and myself, um, uh, discovered this paper and, uh, and interpreted it. Uh, we, because we were seeing results, uh, we were making ohmic contacts or Schottky barriers in these materials, and the work function and the barrier height were directly uh, proportional to each other. And in fact, uh, uh, when this individual published this paper, gallium nitride was not known. So it was not in their, in their chart. Uh, uh, let me explain, because it has, uh, it has significant implications uh, for other fields also. The traditional materials like silicon and gallium arsenide are in here. And, uh, and this uh, factor in here is uh, the ratio of the barrier height versus the work function. And uh, 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 when this is equal to 1, means when you uh, change the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the barrier height, uh, the, the, metal work uh, me the metal work function, the barrier height does not change. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, I'm sorry, this is 0. Uh, but if it, for this material, which are highly ionic material, this is equal to 1, uh, which means uh, the, the work function and the barrier height uh, uh, they depend proportionally to each other. And, uh, and so, so very important. Uh, this, pa this paper was done as a master thesis and was referenced by now more than 300 times. It's a, a very important paper. Now, uh, 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 Kevin Smith, um, uh, in, his own, in his own nitrites uh, uh, research uh, group, uh, uh, developed in, uh, in, uh, at Boston University all of these tools uh, to study the, both the bulk as well as the surface electronic structure. And uh, I would not uh, walk you through here, but he really confirmed experimentally uh, that indeed uh, uh, here is the, the band structure of gallium nitride, uh, the valence band. And uh, as you see, there are some uh, states over here uh, which are not dispersive uh, within the Brillouin zone. Uh, and uh, those states, uh, they have uh, SPZ character, uh, which is characteristic of dangling bonds. And uh, if you uh, put inside your ultra high vacuum uh, system uh, uh, hydrogen, uh, those states disappear. Uh, Kevin is in here, and if, uh, if you want to ask a question about this, in fact, uh, I should make the statement, everything the field knows uh, about uh, bulk and surface electronic structure was developed in, here in his group. Uh, now, the phase separation phenomenon, which I mentioned earlier, uh, is, uh, again, uh, uh, people who still remember thermodynamics, uh, uh, mater uh, materials uh, undergo phase separation by a process called spinodal decomposition, and in here, is gallium nitride, and here 100% indium nitride, and this, this is the alloy. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and this, uh, uh, these are calculations uh, done uh, by Stringfellow, a well-known material scientist uh, in, in this field. And, uh, and uh, he did these calculations using a modified valence force field, but there are more recent density functional theory uh, calculations also, which the results are slightly different. Uh, the experimental points uh, work one, was work uh, done uh, in our group uh, by Dr. Dopalapudi uh, and, um, and uh, uh, under uh, joint supervision uh, of uh, Professor Basu and myself. Um, 
in a, a, in now uh, let me explain what this curve means. If we grow these materials at 800 or 700, uh, 700 degrees um, uh, centigrade, which is 1,000 degrees Kelvin, uh, what this says, you cannot put more than 10% indium. Uh, if you put more than 10% indium, uh, the, the, um, the material is not stable. Uh, in, uh, it turns out uh, that between the, uh, these two curves, uh, the, 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 between these two curves, the material is metastable, but may, for all practical purposes, stable. It can last a century. And, uh, and so, so we can then uh, potentially put uh, up to 20% indium with no problem. Uh, of course, if we try to put more than that, then the material would tend to phase separate. And as you remember, the indium gallium nitrate efficiency starts falling dramatically as soon as we put more than 20% indium. <coughs> now, uh, here is the, uh, some of the results which show as we try to put 30%, 37% indium, immediately starts phase separating in, it, in its components. Now, another important phenomenon also uh, discovered in here through the joint collaboration of Ludwigs and, and my group is the atomic, uh, the atomic ordering. As you know, alloys uh, tend to uh, have uh, a random structure. In other words, there is no way to predict where the atoms are uh, in an alloy. Uh, it does that in order to maximize its entropy. Now, uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, we discovered in here in 1997 for the first time that under certain growth conditions, all the aluminum atoms, if we let's say have 50% aluminum and 50% gallium, all aluminum atoms go in here, all the gallium atoms go in here, and so on and so forth. And this is called ordering. Now, uh, uh, this, if uh, the entire crystal is ordered like this, that would have been a blessing. Unfortunately, uh, and the, the way we discover the ordering is by x-rays, where instead of seeing the, uh, the allowed uh, diffractions, we see these other diffractions in here, uh, which are not allowed. And this is the criterion uh, we do it. And we have found even more complex uh, 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 ordering uh, with more, or as we call them, super lattice lattice uh, lines. Uh, using either electron microscopy or uh, uh, X-ray diffraction. Now, uh, uh, what uh, uh, Dopalopudi has shown uh, with Basu uh, is uh, through electron microscopy, they discover not the entire crystal is ordered, but there are domains which are ordered. They show this uh, super lattice line, and there are the other domains B which are not ordered. And uh, as we grow the material thicker, it tends to, uh, to, to become more order. Uh, this is an extreme case since then, uh, which was uh, in the late 90s. Uh, uh, we uh, uh, significantly uh, improved this, but this was a dramatic result to show how ordering occurs. Uh, now, uh, in, uh, if we then try to make devices out of this partially ordered aluminum gallium nitrate alloys, we observe the uh, the, the following anomalous behavior. If we make detectors of light, photoconductive detectors, and we measure what is known the product, uh, the mobility times the lifetime of the electrons, uh, uh, and we did this for gallium nitride materials versus the resistivity of the films, we did it also for aluminum gallium nitride materials as a function of uh, aluminum percentage. What we observe is for 50% aluminum, the, the, this product here is two orders of magnitude larger than gallium nitride. And this is completely, uh, at the time, a very puzzling phenomenon. Because uh, for gallium nitride, you expect to have higher mobility because it's a binary than an alloy. Uh, you don't have alloy scattering, in other words. The lifetime also is expected to be here larger than in an alloy. And this was completely anomalous. And uh, as experimentalists, and I advise my students, if you don't have an exact theory, publish your result uh, with, a, uh, with a model. Uh, and uh, if you're right, fine. If you're not right, someone else will tell you that you were not right. <laughs> um, 
in, uh, and so, so uh, uh, Mistra and other students uh, in Korakakis, uh, they published this paper uh, uh, that we speculated that the order and the disorder domains, the random domains, their band gaps don't line up. But instead, they form what is known a, a, a type two heterostructure. Uh, this is the conduction and the valence band of the random domains and the adjacent order domains like this. And as you are injecting electrons and holes uh, into the semiconductor, as you see, electrons preferring here, holes preferring here, they don't like to recombine. And we then, uh, Zunga, uh, which is a well-known theorist, uh, saw this publication and worked out the theory. And indeed, he showed that if you put up to 30 to 40 percent uh, 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 aluminum, the material converts from type 1 heterostructure into type 2 heterostructure. Um, uh, so now, uh, regarding the development of green LEDs, we addressed it, uh, uh, which is uh, the, uh, a topic of research still, uh, both at BU as well as, well as in other universities. Uh, we addressed it uh, with three different ways. One is uh, we developed green LEDs on textured gallium nitride templates, which one of my students in here developed by a different method, some kind of quasi-textured uh, substrates. And uh, uh, I did not discuss the polarization effects because I don't have the time, but it is a, an undesirable uh, uh, property these materials have, which reduces the LED uh, out optical output. And, uh, and so if you use a texture substrate as we do, the quantum wells conform with that, that texture substrate and you are suppressing these polarization effects. In addition to, I mentioned to you earlier, the extraction of light from the surface of the LED is a difficult problem if you have an atomically smooth surface. However, if you have a textured surface due to multiple scattering, the light eventually makes it out, so improves the light extraction. Uh, the second approach is to not use LEDs based on quantum wells, but based on quantum dots. And uh, the quantum dots, due to their small size, uh, they, they do not tend to, have, uh, uh, to, to phase separate, uh, and they don't have this uh, tendency for atomic ordering, because both of those phenomena are strain driven. And uh, since the strain is relieved in the surface, uh, the, uh, uh, these materials are ideal to make these devices. And finally, in collaboration with Professor uh, Paella, uh, we are developing uh, plasmonics as a, an alternative method to enhance the green LEDs. Now, the first method for which we have also intellectual property developed uh, is shown in here, uh, uh, green LEDs, and also by designing the, the texture appropriately, we were able to make LEDs which emit uh, all of the uh, blue as well as uh, uh, green. And uh, thus, by mixing this, you make white light. And so we call this phosphorless uh, white LED. Uh, and, but most importantly, uh, we, by, uh, by injecting it with different current, we can uh, uh, vary uh, the color. We can make this all the way from blue to green, covering all the colors. Uh, it's very important uh, for uh, architectural purposes primarily. The second approach is to use quantum dots. And quantum dots, as you see, uh, uh, shown in here with atomic force microscopy, or shown in here by transmission electron microscopy. And uh, those quantum dots, uh, as you see in the electron microscopy, they are perfect. The, disl the dislocations avoid the quantum dots. They go between the quantum dots, but they don't penetrate into quantum dots. And so we use that method. And instead of using quantum wells uh, between the N and the P layer, uh, we put quantum dots uh, um, in here. And we made uh, a, a green LEDs, uh, not only green LEDs, but we made this method uh, uh, also red LEDs, which is uh, an, an important development because these materials are better than using the phosphides and arsenides 
uh, to make red LEDs. Of course, they are not very efficient yet. Um, now, the method which uh, was spearheaded by Professor Paella uh, is plasmon enhanced green LEDs, where we are making by molecular beam epitaxy the green LEDs, and then Professor Paella uh, and his group, they deposit uh, 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 silver nanoparticles using lithographies. And as you see in here, the, the photoluminescence intensity uh, depending on the size and the, the, peri the period of those nanoparticles increases as much close to a factor of five, uh, which is very significant. Uh, and uh, and this, uh, this work is funded by, uh, by, by, by DOE. Now, uh, but the aluminum gallium nitride problems uh, uh, alloys, as I told you earlier, is the ones which show the most difficult um, uh, to un uh, they are the most difficult to understand. Uh, and uh, and the, the reasons uh, uh, the community speculates is these materials are very uh, defective and primarily because the active nitrogen, the atomic nitrogen, let's say, uh, is very reactive and soon as it comes down, uh, it encounters a gallium or an aluminum atom and they react and nucleate and they don't give the atoms uh, uh, time to wander around to find equilibrium positions. So as a result, you make in materials with very small domains, and as I told you earlier, this leads to high density of dislocations. Uh, and uh, there are some other problems. Uh, the coalescence of small domains lead to tensile stresses, and uh, this develops cracks and so on and so forth. So this is one of the problems. The other problem, aluminum, has a tremendous uh, chemical affinity for oxygen. And these materials, no matter how you do them, they always you have oxygen impurities in the process gases. And this oxygen, uh, 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 while in the indium gallium nitride put state, uh, is a donor and put uh, is, is a desirable impurity, for aluminum gallium nitride is an undesirable impurity because introduces states exactly in the middle of the gap, and therefore they are efficient non-radiative recombination centers. Uh, now, uh, there are other problems which are related to the injection efficiency. For example, as you increase the energy gap, it's more difficult to, I, to dope this material CNMP type. And also, there are fundamental uh, band structure issues, uh, which I will not uh, discuss in here. Uh, the valence band changes, and as a result, the extraction of light as you go deeper into the UV uh, becomes more difficult. Now, uh, our approach uh, to addressing the aluminum gallium nitride, some of it we published, in, in fact, one paper just appeared this week, uh, uh, is uh, to develop methods to introduce band structure potential fluctuations in aluminum gallium nitride. Perhaps I may have mentioned earlier, this is not occurring naturally because aluminum and gallium have exactly the same uh, 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 radius, and therefore the ma this material does not have a tendency for phase separation. And if we manage to do that, then we will introduce uh, potential fluctuations, as I told you, in which they localize the electrons and holes to prevent them from migrating to defects. And also, the second important thing is to, so, so in other words, we cannot do anything with the defects. Uh, because of these uh, uh, issues I discussed previously. So now we try to do something to prevent the electrons from reaching the defects. Uh, now the other thing is to develop methods uh, to, incorpor to prevent incorporation of oxygen. And, uh, and, now, um, and this is how we did it. And, uh, and we have uh, both intellectual property in here as well as publications coming out. Uh, we grew the al uh, aluminum gallium uh, uh, alloys by plasma assisted MB, but under a mode of growth, uh, which is uh, does generally you want to grow aluminum gallium nitride, you will choose nitrogen, the atoms of nitrogen you send, you choose them to, to be exactly equal to the sum of the aluminum and the gallium atoms. Then you grow stoichiometric aluminum gallium nitride. But instead, uh, early on, uh, a, a student here in my group discovered that 
uh, if you set the aluminum and gallium and you have certain amount of nitrogen only, the nitrogen prefers to, do, to, to, to bond with the nitrogen and only if there is excess nitrogen will bond with the gallium. And this, the reason for that is because the aluminum nitrogen bond is significantly stronger than the gallium nitrogen bond. So we took advantage of this knowledge and say, fine, then when we grow these materials, we will grow them with excess gallium. And so the material, the film we grow, is covered on the top uh, with excess gallium, uh, several monolayers of gallium. And thus, the growth process now, the nitrogen and the aluminum have to dissolve into gallium in order to reach the film and, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, form the alloy. And thus, the process has been converted from molecular beam epitaxy to liquid phase epitaxy. And uh, uh, the driving force for this uh, is, uh, is we have a constant supply uh, of the nitrogen and the aluminum. Now, uh, in, uh, uh, and so uh, this uh, has uh, both, because the gallium uh, uh, layer on the top is not likely to be uniform, but have thickness uh, variations of, of the gallium coverage, uh, as you saturate it, in some regions you are saturating with more aluminum, in, such, in su others with less aluminum, and therefore you are creating compositionally homogeneities and potential fluctuations. As important is the gallium reacts with the oxygen coming from the impurities and forms gallium oxides, which are uh, very volatile, and therefore they never incorporate into the films. We found out if we grow these materials without this excess gallium, they have as much as 10 to the 20 atoms per cubic centimeter of oxygen. When we do it with this process, by Sims analysis, we see 10 to the 16, four orders of magnitude reduction in oxygen, which is an extremely important result. Now, um, <clears throat> so, um, so, so uh, uh, I think I described this, uh, and so we use this method and we make quantum wells, and as you see, uh, uh, we use the same method as uh, the Santa Barbara group. We measure the photoluminescence as a function of temperature, and we uh, plot the in intensity of the photoluminescence versus one over temperature, and using the same technique, uh, we find uh, uh, that the internal quantum efficiency is 50%. It is um, a factor of 1,000 larger than what has been reported by the Chichibu's paper um, in a, a very significant result. And, uh, and we then, uh, uh, this uh, luminescence, as you notice, emits uh, 250 nanometers, which is deep into the UV. And the student was ambitious to go even deeper into the UV, down to 210 to 20 nanometer. And you see the internal quantum efficiency, even in those materials, are very significant. Uh, so with this now uh, in our arm, uh, we went and make uh, UV LEDs, and, um, and the, less, the, less, uh, uh, the last student who just graduated uh, uh, made UV LEDs using these processes I described, emitting all the way from 320 down to 265, which I told you is the uh, magic number for water, uh, water purification. And those devices, uh, at this moment, we get two milliwatts uh, of power at 273 nanometers uh, for this device, uh, which is uh, a, a very significant result uh, for this. These are unpackaged devices. Now we try to figure out. Uh, as importantly, we are collaborating with a company in Pasadena uh, uh, who, uh, uh, from uh, 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 what uh, this company has done, they bought commercial LEDs emitting at 280 nanometers and 255 nanometers and took our LEDs, uh, which uh, we are activating with an electron beam. And uh, I will call this the trend line. In, uh, you know, of course, trend line with two, two points is difficult, but uh, nevertheless, uh, allow me to do it. Uh, and uh, and uh, this is our trend line. And so if uh, this commercial house has an LED uh, where ours is the peak, uh, 
this LED of ours is 2,000 uh, uh, times uh, uh, larger. Uh, my dean is, 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 is looking at his watch. And, uh, and recently, uh, these results were uh, uh, reproduced. A carbon copy, actually, uh, uh, we, re we reported, as I showed you, in 2009, uh, a month ago, uh, uh, or two months ago, uh, Kyoto University uh, did exactly the identical structure and uh, they see uh, the same result as ourselves, to within, to within error. Uh, as you see, uh, this is where the, the majority of the community is, and these are these two groups now uh, are. Uh, and uh, we believe, um, uh, I would not go into the summary because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, I want to, <laughs> I have to have good relations <laughs> with my dean. <laughs> now, I want to uh, give credit to our funding agencies, both current and past. Uh, NSF, of course, uh, Department of Energy, NASA, uh, DARPA, we got a, a large grant now, uh, ARL, ONR, and uh, recently we have a grant with Sylvania. Uh, and um, uh, of course, I want to thank uh, most of all my family and uh, my wife who put, put up with me all of these years. <laughs> And, uh, and also my grandchildren, whom I see only when uh, uh, my daughters bring them to my laboratory uh, to do some experiments with them. And in, in, in here, we try to discover why flowers, when you dip them into liquid nitrogen, they become stiff. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, why, uh, when you warm them up, they, they recover. Thank you very much. Question or two before we go to the reception. Anyone? Yes, Hardy. Yeah, very interesting work. Uh, you mentioned that the uh, mobility lifetime product was enhanced because of the fluctuation in composition of right. the indium gallium nitride. No, uh, we we did it, uh, we did this in aluminum gallium nitride. In aluminum gallium nitride, and the theory by uh, by by uh, Zanger was done also in aluminum gallium nitride. However, I urge him to do the calculations in indium gallium nitride because uh, fundamentally there is no reason why this should not have occurred there. I guess the question really was: it's good for photoconductivity, but wouldn't it be bad for emission? Uh, well, it's good for photoconductivity because this is called photoconductive gain. Uh, in photoconductive detectors, you like to the lifetime to be as large as possible, uh, and uh, they are sluggish, um, and uh, that's why you use photovoltaic detectors when speed is important. But when uh, uh, you don't want to, to get preamplifiers, you like to get uh, gain, and this have gain. The gain, incidentally, of those was 10 to the 4. Uh, it's a very significant uh, photoconductive detectors. Another question, Mal? Yes, Mal. Uh, yes, the, uh, you mentioned that the UVB, uh, that the microorganisms have learned to protect themselves and repair the DNA damage. Uh, and they haven't done that for the UVC because it doesn't come through. Exactly. Yes. That is exactly. Yeah. So I'm wondering how long do you think it'll be before they learn? <laughs> <laughs> that. Uh, you know, we'll, I leave it for the biologist to, to tell us. Maybe the dean will answer that question. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, before, before we go to the reception, just a few final remarks uh, to complement my introductory, more formal introductory remarks. First of all, um, what an extraordinary volume of, of incredible work and creative work by Ted. Uh, Ted thanked uh, his family, which of course, well, he should. But of course, I hope he realizes that all of us are part of your family, and that's how we feel about you. Ted is really an icon of excellence and impact and, and incredible dedication to Boston University and, and its role and its uh, visibility in this world. And he's done us a tremendous, tremendous wonder in, in, in putting us on the map of having this incredible impact in this field. Um, I can tell you personally that when any, an, anyone comes in that I meet in the material science area or in the uh, 
solid state physics area, ca faculty candidates or whatever, they always bring up Ted as a beacon of excellence and it just makes me so proud to have him here. And I just want to, everyone to know we're going to give him two things. One is a framed uh, oh, thanks version of the uh, announcement of the uh, Distinguished Scholar and Lecture Award. And the other one is we've created a, uh, a uh, the closest thing we can get to an endowed chair. Um, <laughs> it actually is named, it says right on the back here, Ted Moustakis, College of Engineering, the th 2011 Distinguished Scholar. So again, let's thank Ted and thank him for just being one of our family. Thank you, Ted.